Hi there. My name is David Batsoffen and I host a travel blog called Travel and Things. And at the moment I'm doing a series called In Conversation With. And this morning I'm talking to co-founder of um, Wildlife Campus. That's Todd Kaplan. Todd, morning. How are you doing? David, very th thank you very much uh, for having me on your show. Firstly, I'm assuming that's green screen behind you. Otherwise, I'm extremely jealous. Uh, no, we are unfortunately not breaking the uh, travel ban. I am not in East Africa. <laughs> uh, it's unfortunately 10 o'clock in the morning and uh, not dawn or dusk or wherever that picture uh, might have been. Uh, more wishful thinking and let's set the mood uh, and pretend we can go there. Fair enough. So tell me a bit about Wild Campus, Wildlife Campus. Well, so uh, Wildlife Campus, uh, I suppose the origin story, uh, yeah. the new term everybody's using, um, yeah. and something you'll, of course, be familiar with. Uh, has, <laughs> That's a sneaky has aside. Let, okay, let me, let me set the scene. 20 Go years ago, give or take a year or two, I started a course with Wildlife Campus, which I still have not finished. Uh, well, the, 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 while, while David is one of our uh, oldest and most cherished um, <laughs> students, um, I, in fact, we, we in fact met the first time uh, when we both worked for a company called Africam. So back in 98, uh, Africam, they were the first guys to put cameras at water holes and then later yeah. uh, onto game drive vehicles. And while today that seems fairly pedestrian uh, and, and not particularly exciting, um, back then, it was revolutionary, um, almost impossible to do a, a, a massive technical feat. And in 98, 99, Wild, uh, Africam rather, was one of South Africa's most popular websites, and in fact, one of the most popular websites in the world. So even though it was uh, a slightly out of focus, grainy 30 second refresh image uh, from a waterhole <laughs> in Juma Game Reserve, uh, it attracted a massive uh, worldwide following. Uh, literally hundreds of thousands uh, of members all watching for free. And while the, the, the guys that started that one, uh, Paul Clifford and Graham Wallington, uh, are, were, were deep bush enthusiasts, uh, neither were uh, ecologists. And they found they quickly had an interesting problem to solve. And that problem was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of email uh, from viewers of their cameras around the world going, what is that antelope? Uh, why is that elephant doing that? Is that bird a migrant? Is it a resident? Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, a, a, a truly astounding amount of mail uh, that this was attracting. Uh, they first attempted to solve the problem with hiring, let's call him a, a, a content specialist, to give replies. Um, but that was completely overwhelming. Uh, there was no way anybody could cope. They would have to have hired a team. So the solution to that particular problem um, was sought by the new CEO they brought in in 1999, uh, a guy called Peter Armitage, to run the business from a business perspective. They were looking for an adult in the boardroom. Uh, nobody <laughs> told them that Peter was 29 uh, at the time. Uh, and Peter's idea uh, was we've got to put something together with Africam that will complement the content. And what was born out of that was Wildlife Campus. Not Wildlife Campus to begin with. It first started as Afri College or Wild Campus. Uh, there were many names. Uh, we eventually came to Wildlife Campus by virtue of the fact that it was available as a domain name. <laughs> uh, we, in fact, really wanted Wild Campus. Um, but the, the guys that owned it wanted $8,000. And $8,000 uh, in rands back in 99 was a vast amount of money. So uh, we settled on Wildlife Campus, but we've been happy to have done so. So that was the origin of it. So Wildlife Campus came into being as uh, the world's first virtual campus dedicated uh, to wildlife and guiding. And we started with. Uh, a course that David knows quite well, uh, game ranging or field guiding. So David, how far through the 82 chapters are you? 
Can, should I lie or should I be honest? Four. <laughs> Four. All right. Well, why can't so, I lie? You can look it up on your computer. I mean, you could have called up my results if you really wanted to. No, no. A, a student results uh, are sacrosanct. Uh, <laughs> Is it like, you would like doctor-patient relationship, doctor-patient <laughs> confidentiality? So, uh, kind of moving on from that. So. Uh, David and I uh, met uh, at AfriCam. Uh, I was running Wildlife Campus. Uh, David was running AfriCam Radio. Mm. And now you're still running AfriCam Radio, in, in a sense. Of. In a sense. Sort of. You know, it was, it was um, interesting, because you, you allude to those early cameras, Todd. And a lot of times there were technical difficulties when there was like a giraffe at a water hole and he'd been there for four days in the same position because the camera was frozen and they couldn't get to the cameras on a regular basis to, to maintain them. Or you'd get an insect on the lens and it wouldn't move and it'd be sitting right in the middle of the lens. The stuff was awesome. It was groundbreaking Absolutely. in a way. So what, what, what made it so unique is uh, back then it predated all the, the technologies that we take for granted today. Uh, there was no such thing as Wi-Fi, there was no 3G, there was no fiber lines, uh, there was no DSL lines. Uh, to get the image out the bush, they used radio repeaters, yeah. line of sight radio repeaters <laughs> to get uh, out of the Sabi Sands uh, and down to Nelspreit where they hooked onto a very expensive uh, so ISDN line. Um, well, no, it was, it, it was a feet and a half and those cameras were of course also in uh, some remote locations. Um, so no, there was there's some deep technical challenges. <laughs> but of course, a, while a fantastic concept. Um, the other thing it predated was Google. So they had uh, no real advertising model to speak of. Mm. Uh, it was the time of the dot-com bubble. Um, Africam was uh, on track for a fantastic list, listing on uh, the NASDAQ. Um, but 9-11 uh, killed it. Uh, and when they finally decided to charge for uh, AfriCam for the, the viewing, it was too late. Uh, they needed 10,000 people all paying $6 a month. Uh, they got 513 yeah. or so. So AfriCam didn't last, unfortunately. Uh, AfriCam Radio went down with it. Uh, and in fact, Wildlife Campus too. So it was, it was a division, not a separate company at the time. But uh, Peter and I bought it. Uh, effectively out of the liquidated assets uh, of, uh, of uh, AfriCam and, and took it forward. Now we've had some uh, a fairly amazing strides since then. So uh, as, as you mentioned earlier, Wildlife Campus is 20 years old. So uh, we really have been um, part of the industry for, uh, for a long time. And from the early days of that single uh, game ranging or field guiding course, we now offer 46 different courses. Uh, we've attracted close on 30,000 registered students from 155 countries. Um, yeah, it's the place to go for your online wildlife education. It's interesting that, that you know, you've been, go you've been going for 20 years now. And now, if you look at just 2020, so it's 20 in 2020, um, sure. that lockdown has caused people to turn back to look for online stuff. So you actually predated all of this um, and, and have been doing this on a regular basis for the last 20 years. Exactly right. And, and in fact, we've had uh, very little direct competition in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. So we belong to, we're, we're a Fagasa uh, endorsed training provider, the Field Guiding Association of South Africa. Uh, and it's a fairly crowded space in, uh, for training providers. So for, you'd in fact, David, know more than, than, than me, direct numbers, must be at least 50, perhaps yeah. 60 uh, endorsed training providers. Um, they all offer, however, for the most part, a practical course. That's where the big money is. Uh, and certainly uh, for those guys and they're set up and they've put in vast amount of, of resources uh, in terms of facilities and they're taking uh, groups of perhaps up to 20 students and they're keeping there for between 55 days in a year. So uh, it's a mammoth undertaking. Now, of course, all of these training providers have been uh, pretty much 
uh, put on hold from uh, a COVID restriction perspective. Uh, and even though some have opened now, you simply just can't get to them. This is the thing, you know, Todd. Uh, somebody said to me, aren't you dying to get back in the bush? And I said, yes, I am. But by the same token, in that same breath, I'm going, but do I want to? Because I don't know who I'm going to be with or where they have been. So this is the this is the dichotomy at the moment that I sit with as a as a non-travel traveling travel writer uh, currently is I want to travel but I don't uh, I, I don't mind going to a lodge where there's nobody <laughs> and as long as I've got God Blanche to wander around the place by myself but I don't know if I want to to be in a facility where there are twenty or thirty people and I don't know where those twenty or thirty people have been prior uh, to absolutely. driving. And this is the uh, and, and, and that's the issue. So for a lot of those, uh, the, the other training providers, uh, to kind of bridge the gap, they've uh, put together their own forms of, of online course. Um, and I'm not here to, uh, to denigrate any of our competitors. Um, but it's, it, it's a thing they were forced to do, not something they particularly perhaps yeah. planned to do. So for those of you that are interested at all in, in wildlife campus and the the 45, 46 courses that we have. Uh, and let me just mention a few of there, other than the field guiding, game ranging, wildlife management, game lodge management, by far our most popular course. Uh, Anti-poaching, uh, probably a very close second. Uh, game capture and, and, and translocation, animal tracks and signs, which was written for us by uh, the Stuarts, Chris and Matilda and Tilda Stewart. Um, intensive wildlife production, survival, uh, a whole behavior guide series written for us um, by David Estes. Uh, those in the industry will be familiar with, uh, with, with his um, publication. Um, Digital Wildlife Photography, um, Garth Thompson's guide, Guide's Guide to Guiding uh, is a fantastic one. Still one uh, of my favorite books for a variety of yeah. different reasons. <laughs> uh, and, and spectacularly illustrated. Uh, yes. And those that look behind David's shoulder. Uh, we'll get a hint of that. Yeah, the, but the illustrator was my, is my father-in-law, by <laughs> Dorf to, to those that, that have, have any interest. So if you go along to wildlifecampus.com, um, before you make any kind of purchase decision, what we allow you to do is uh, to try out uh, one free component, the first chapter, if you like, uh, from all the courses on offer. So you'll be guided to depending on where your interests lie. Uh, and try it out. There's also uh, 10 free courses. So uh, go and have a look at it. So you can access the content online, you can download it, uh, you can even take the test uh, and see what the assessment is like and, and see if this kind of uh, learning is, is for you. So we say to students uh, that express an interest that uh, we're for the serious, the curious, uh, and the career orientated. So uh, it's a formal, informal type of um, uh, learning system. Those that are looking for industry recognized uh, qualifications, uh, we offer that to you. Those, however, that are just simply looking to improve their own personal experiences when allowed into the bush, or rather allowed back into the bush at some yet to be determined future date, um, that's 50% uh, uh, of all of our students. So they're not looking to become game rangers, field guides, wildlife managers, game lodge managers, anti-poachers, or the rest of it, but they're, uh, they, they have a, uh, an abiding deep interest uh, mm -hmm. in wildlife in the bush. Um, and this is a, a great deal more fun, more beneficial, uh, more interactive than buying a textbook and attempting to read it. Uh, and it allows you to join a, a large worldwide community of students uh, and interact if you choose to do so. That was going to be my next question. Can the students interact with each other or can they only interact with college management? So, no. So we, we, we very encourage uh, the, the, the student community uh, to communicate with each other. Uh, and we offer uh, all the usual uh, social media platforms, um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, and the rest of it. Those are all available. Uh, and... Over the years, in fact, students that have uh, come together on Wildlife Campus uh, have made the effort to come together uh, in a physical setting. So we've had students that have organized uh, group get-togethers all around the world, uh, including a few in South Africa. Um, 
and went down, in fact, to the to Juma Game Reserve that uh, hosted one of them uh, some years ago. So no, students are, are very much encouraged to uh, to contact each other uh, and share their experiences. In fact, yeah. uh, at the moment, uh, the Wildlife Campus Facebook group, uh, and you'll find the link from our site, um, ran a photographic competition uh, for all of June. Mm -hmm. uh, a and, and it was a, a completely student-driven uh, initiative. Okay. So that uh, whoever got uh, the most likes uh, on their photo uh, during the month of June, uh, and it was, well, it was thousands and thousands um, uh, of entries and likes, um, won a free course of their choice. And we'll run that again probably from August. So okay. there's lots to see. There's, uh, there's lots to do other than the, the straight courses um, for the last, uh, three months or so, uh, we've put together uh, an e-zine, uh, online magazine, and uh, you preempting my questions. I'm just sitting here watching you. Let me ask a question, <laughs> uh, And and, and uh, we, we we're pleased to uh, announce uh, our eminent uh, guest contributor. Uh, it's Mr. David Batson. <laughs> The, the magazine is one is, is really cool. I mean, aside from the fact that I'm contributing back page stuff um, and not the back page of the Sunday Times of what that used to be. There's no naked <laughs> photographs of me on that. That would be too scary. But just to, to ask you a question now, um, what about the practical components? Are you going to set up sort of an online video game where you can do advanced rifle handling or maybe... Um, uh, a game drive so that you can do a, a game drive assessment, but do it all online. You can have targets, uh, you can do shooting, sure. all of that, like off an Xbox or something. So Wildlife Campus is, is committed to always remaining uh, a, a theory provider. So okay. while we can do the, uh, the background on rifle handling uh, and approaching dangerous game, uh, th there is no real substitute for those that are looking specifically into the, into the industry uh, to undertake a practical. So for, for those that consider our courses and, and look at the vast amount of other courses available, so what we recommend is for those that, that are specifically career oriented and, and are taking the, the material investment in, uh, in a practical course, which, I mean, the, the, the prices vary quite widely, but um, the year courses are over 100,000 Rand. Mm. They get a great deal more of the, from the course, from having completed the theory component first. So we deal quite a bit uh, and we collaborate with other practical providers uh, and we encourage their students to complete our theory first before going on the practical. So because there's so much to learn uh, and the curriculum is, is so vast uh, and the time is so precious when your boots on the ground, um, that those students that have internalized at first, completed the course, get so much more from that practical experience. So uh, those that uh, arrive uninitiated perhaps are trying to come to grips with a concept of an ecosystem with a, uh, compared to those that have already completed a course can apply it immediately. Yeah. Uh, and get a great deal more out of it. You know, instead of attempting to learn uh, 10,001 facts, uh, if you've already internalized most of it, and our course is not about uh, memorizing and spinning it back to us. Um, it's about applying what you know. I've so discovered that, that because the questions are asked in a very specific way when you do the, the tests or the assessments, and they drove me mad. And I then questioned the way in which they'd been asked. And I was told that the answers are unimportant. What you're trying to do and I understand this, that what you're trying to do is see if the student actually understands the material or if they're just regurgitating, which is what we did at school and university. You just get information you. and you vomit it back and then they give you 100% or in my case for my electrical engineering, 4%, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, but in your, in, with um, Wildlife Campus, what you've done is you've made people stop and think when they look at the answers, because you do multiple choice. It's the only way you can do it online, really, because nobody's going to sit and mark an essay. And, and you have to read the questions carefully, and you have to That's understand the work in order to answer them. 
Thank you. Now, I appreciate you, you having brought that up. So yeah, the assessment uh, is online and automated, so, you, so students can do it in their own time. Uh, and it, it's, it's designed as an open book type of assessment, which it must be. We give yeah. you the material, we give you the questions. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's fairly difficult to successfully pass those assessments without referring to the material. So, you know, if, we, if, if the course content said an elephant is gray, you won't find a question that says true or false, elephants are gray. Yeah. You find a question that says, because elephants are gray, they blend into their environment, true, false. Well, that's an entirely different type of question. Yeah. Um, that uh, does uh, fairly frequently um, make some students exasperated at, uh, <laughs> uh, at the assessments. What do you mean you're, you're not asking <laughs> elephants are gray? I know elephants are gray. The, the text says elephants are gray. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm needing to apply it. But uh, yeah, it's about coming to your own conclusion. Yeah. Uh, more than coming to what I consider, wildlife campus considers the answer. Yeah. So, uh, and, and that's the learning approach we've had for 20 years. Uh, we like to think it's worked. Uh, we certainly have past graduates working in top lodges uh, throughout uh, sub-Saharan Africa, so we must have done uh, something right over the time. What is your background? When, when Todd Cap, it's a, it's a question I've been asking people in this industry. When Todd Kaplan was in matric, what did he want to be? Uh, when Todd Kaplan was in matric, uh, I had already come to the realization that uh, my final marks were not going to be sufficient for an honest to put uh, entry. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, ha I had, in fact, been sent for um, kind of well, psychometric assessment. What, sh what, what, should, what should I be? Uh, yeah. And what they came back with was uh, game ranger, forest ranger, uh, or geologist. Oh, okay. Uh, and and I was, in fact, I was quite keen on the, on the game ranging route. Now, to be a game ranger, and that's not quite the field guy, this is the guys working for Park Sport, if you like, mm. uh, short shorts, long socks. Um, in order to, that qualification was a national uh, certificate in nature conservation, a three year uh, qualification through the Technicons. But back then, a prerequisite was national service. You couldn't get into that program unless you had done national service. Uh, okay. Uh, and this was for me uh, 1990. So national service was still a thing, not for mm -hmm. very much longer, but still a thing then. Um, so uh, yeah, I rather went uh, the varsity route. Um, so I've got a, my, my undergrad in zoology, botany, entomology, uh, with a failed chemistry. Um, <laughs> was, was the undergrad at Rhodes uh, and postgrad uh, at the Centre for Wildlife Management at the University of Pretoria uh, in wildlife management and ecology. So that was. Uh, from a kind of basic uh, education, mm. um, I'd always thought uh, I'd, I'd, I'd go and you know, save the, the elephant. Turns out that it was already saved by the time I got there. Uh, I did enjoy some, some time. I, I did work for National Parks, uh, briefly based uh, in the research village in Sikusa. Uh, uh, it was great. Uh, and while I was casting around for what was the next thing, which was probably in the private sector doing environmental impact assessments, um, the wildlife campus opportunity kind of came about. Um, and yeah, we haven't looked back since. What was your time in Skakusa like? What years are we talking, Todd, mid, mid 90s? Uh, yeah, so Parks Board was between, yeah, mid 90s, yeah, exactly uh, mid 90s. Uh, I was taken on, on a, uh, uh, a temporary contract, a beef contract, uh, to undertake a, a malarial study okay. um, for uh, Dr. Brock, who was uh, the park's resident entomologist uh, at the time. And it was, it was only for, th for, for three months, three very hot months from uh, yeah. November, December, January. Wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, they gave me a fantastic uh, caravan that had a fan that didn't do anything. Um, what abiding memory was uh, after a, a midsummer's day in Skakusa, uh, going through to the, the staff village to, to jump in the fantastic staff pool, only to find that the water temperature 
was in fact a degree or so from the air temperature. So <laughs> jumping from 36 into 35, uh, not as much fun as it might be. Uh, but it, uh, what, what, it, what it did have there was uh, a freedom of the park that uh, very few people uh, get to experience. So uh, I was given the full park sport uniform down to the epaulettes, uh, which meant uh, I wasn't restricted in terms of gate times or access roads. Um, go where you want to go, do what you want to do, be responsible about it. Mm. Um, uh, a good time back then. Can't wait to go back. Uh, I, I should imagine now that the park is open for a sort of day trippers, I know that the day that they reopened was absolute chaos uh, because everybody wanted to get in. There were queues outside the gates. I can just imagine it's going to be like the N1 to Cape Town at peak season. No, indeed. I, I'd heard the same. Uh, I'd also heard that they were practicing uh, the required social distancing in vehicles, which meant uh, a maximum of a 70% capacity. So families of four uh, were being turned away. Uh, you, you, you can only have three in that vehicle, uh, which is, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> we'll strange. say no more. We'll say no more on that one because I mean, I keep seeing things about how do you know if it's business travel or leisure travel? I've just, I have just been to a reserve. I went up to do some content production for them and um, I got a permit to cross a provincial border, went through two roadblocks, was stopped at neither, and went to the, there was, the lodge was very weird because it's a high turnover lodge. So there's normally when I've been there, there've been an inordinate amount of people. It's always busy. The dining room is always full. Now you walk in there, it's like post-apocalyptic world. There's nobody. Oh it was myself and a guide. And literally that was it. Um, caused me to, to think about writing a short story that I'm going to set in 2035 when we're in COVID-23 and nothing has changed. <laughs> we're still in wow. stage three lockdown. But uh, that, that being said, um, the gates will eventually reopen. Those courses that you're alluding to or referring to, uh, the practical courses will start again because we do need field guides and we do need people in the bush but in the meantime like you say Todd if people are going to use your facilities to help them bridge this gap whatever this gap might be because it looks every every time people talk they go well maybe it's September October November I think most people are looking at March 2021 um, to be honest so that the courses your your for, for want of a better word, your bridging courses that you're offering are going to stand them in really, really good stead when it comes to next year and the courses are shortened for time, for, for cost-wise, all of those sort of things. They will be. People who have done the wildlife um, campus courses will have a leg up and will be just that little bit ahead of the, of the eight ball. Thank you for that. Uh, and, and we've, in fact, since, uh, since lockdown, seen... Uh, quite a significant uh, uptick uh, in interest in, in new students uh, joining. Uh, and yeah, so just to reiterate, so Wildlife Campus has no due dates, no deadlines, no terms, no set semesters. So anyone is welcome. I know that. <laughs> so anybody is welcome to, to, uh, to register uh, and start any course at any time. So there's absolutely no barriers to entry. Um, uh, not for education, not for age. So uh, we have a completely uh, open admissions policy. Uh, it's what education certainly should look like um, in the 21st century. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, we look um, forward to, to assisting any of uh, anybody with an interest in that. Uh, we look forward to the country opening up again. Um, I've in fact just postponed. I, I, I'm supposed to have left for Kruger this weekend uh, for a week, something we booked uh, a year ago, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, and uh, we, we've postponed that to uh, to October. But of course, we'll see what October looks like. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, a very strange and interesting time uh, for for all South Africans, specifically those uh, in the the travel and tourism industry, uh, and specifically those in wildlife. Uh, those people that I know that have been to reserves. Uh, are all uh, touting spectacular sightings. 
uh, because the, the, the game are just lying on the roads. <laughs> there's well, no cars, I, there's no people. I, I have to say that when we arrived at the reserve, um, I ticked off last year in Kasiri, my long time animal sighting, which is pangolin. And I waited 53 years to find that one. And then luckily the, the, the camp knew about my lust for pangolin, so to speak. And they left me with a tracker for 90 minutes with the animal. It was absolutely stunning. And so second became first and second was Artfark. And I arrived at this particular lodge two weeks ago. We tootle off on an afternoon drive. So, cause I'm getting material for research purposes. And lo and behold, what is walking down the side of the road at four o'clock in the afternoon? An aardvark. Spectacular. It was indeed. We found him two days later at 11 o'clock in the morning in roughly the same area, doing exactly the same thing, just snuffling around. Amazing. Wonderful. Well, certainly, I'll, I'll, I'll have to get uh, the whereabouts of that particular sighting. David, it's been uh, an absolute uh, amazing uh, chain to you again. Uh, I've really appreciated it. Um, yeah, uh, thank I've, you for the opportunity. It's, it's only a pleasure. And before I say goodbye, Todd, people who want to find out more about uh, Wildlife Campus, what do they have to simply, do? Simply the website, uh, www.wildlifecampus.com. Uh, it's all waiting for you. Great stuff. I have been in conversation with Todd Kaplan. Todd, once again, thanks for chatting to me. Sure.